All right, and welcome everyone to, uh, I think, we're, what we will find to be a very special afternoon indeed, an opportunity to uh, hear both the analysis and the remarkable uh, piano technique of our good friend Jeffrey Swan. Jeffrey is a frequent speaker and performer uh, for Wagner societies around the world uh, and has contributed to the Wagner Society of New York on many occasions. A few years ago, uh, Jeffrey uh, made a presentation during our annual seminar on the topic of Parsifal that was absolutely unforgettable. And uh, we look forward to a, a presentation of uh, similar quality and excitement today. Uh, Jeffrey is a professor of piano at New York University, and he is also currently the artist in residence in Northern Arizona University. I hope that you will join me in watching Jeffrey do what he's so very good at and, uh, and thrill us. Good afternoon. I'm Jeffrey Swan, and I have the pleasure today to give you a concert on behalf of the New York Wagner Society from my living room here in New York City, a short program in honor of the new year. Um, when Natalie Wagner asked me to do this concert, I was at first hesitant because I find that so often we try to do concerts in our homes as if they were in some way a surrogate for a concert hall or a replacement for a concert hall an artificial concert hall, but this is not. This is my home, this is my home piano. It's beaten up like all professional pianists' pianos are. Um, I have a wonderful sound and camera person here and Matt Berman to help, but basically this is not, this is as if all of you had come into my home and were having a little private program here. And I picked a program purposely that would fit this kind of the intimacy, the, the, the closeness of having people right here with me in my home. So I avoided sort of the, the swashbuckling, grandstanding kinds of pieces that one would play at Carnegie Hall, or that I like to play, but instead if, if concentrated on pieces I felt that were more suitable, really, to this kind of very intimate environment. The two stipulations that we had made between uh, Natalie Wagner and myself would be there'd be a large work of Beethoven, because we still are celebrating Beethoven's year, now it's less than a month since his birthday, 250th birthday, and of course, there would be some Wagner. But I decided to pick pieces of Wagner and Beethoven, which would fall into this more intimate kind of, of, of realm. And we'll discuss those when we get to it. Now, the first piece on this program is, has this very special meaning to me in this time of the COVID and the lockdown. Um, the one piece that I learned during the really early terrible lockdown period was the Schumann F sharp minor sonata, Schumann's first sonata, Opus 11. And, um, so I, this piece is very much linked to this period to me. And the slow movement of this piece, which is quite detachable, since it existed initially as a song, which he wrote when he was only 18, um, is a perfect example of a quality that Schumann has, which really, I think, no other composer quite has, which is what in German is called Innigkeit, which, yes, intimacy, inwardness, this kind of very private, inside world that Schumann creates in, in a really inimitable way and which I think is expressed beautifully in this movement. So this is the Andante from the Sonata in F sharp minor by Robert Schumann.
I'm now going to play one of Beethoven's last piano sonatas, the Sonata in A-flat major, opus 110. Now, this is no longer the Beethoven of the Eroica, of the Fifth Symphony, the heroic Beethoven who's shaking his fist at fate and who's going to take fate by the throat and conquer. Um, this is a Beethoven um, who now is completely isolated, totally deaf, and is retreating more and more into himself and into his very personal and intimate and spiritual world that he's creating in, out of his own imagination. Um, this sonata is of all the Beethoven sonatas, and maybe of almost all the works of Beethoven, one of the most programmatic, one of the most closely linked to a kind of inner story. The sonata is in three movements. The first movement is marked Andante Cantabile e Molto Espressivo. The second is um, Allegro Molto. And the third is a very complex movement with many tempo changes, but the two basic tempos are Adagio Ma Non Troppo and Allegro Ma Non Troppo. The first movement is extraordinarily sweet, dolce, soft, lovely, um, just um, beautiful. <laughs> um, Beethoven uses an interesting word in the beginning. In German, he writes Zanft. Zanft means soft, but not soft as like piano soft, or not even soft like a cushion is soft, but rather soft like the breeze on one's face is soft. It's very special softness quality. The second movement, which is, takes the place of a scherzo, um, is as different as it's possible to be. It's um, almost brutally uh, sort of asymmetrical and out of order. All the accents are on the wrong syllable. Um, it's based on two drinking songs, two very vulgar drinking songs, actually. Um, and uh, the first of which will be used again in the next movement. The, everything in this movement is completely topsy-turvy and crazy. It's followed immediately, and each movement in the sonata follows the, 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 the next without a break. The last movement begins with a very uh, kind of remarkably written passage where the tempo changes almost every measure, and Beethoven writes an extraordinarily large number of expressive marks. But basically, it's a recitative, a very muted recitative. The piano plays with a soft pedal and uh, creates a very special sort of muffled sound. And um, it's like the sufferings, it's like the drunk man from the second movement has come home and is now looking into his soul and seeing how bad things are. Um, and then out of this suffering, this muted suffering, comes this great song of, really, of, of sadness, of despair, which Beethoven in Italian calls Arioso Dolente. In German, it's called Klagender Gesang, which means the song of complaint, the song of wailing, the song of pity, the song of, of, of suffering. Um, and it has its say and dies off. And then out of this comes this fugue, an A flat major, um, strong, almost religious sounding. It has this very, very deep inner strength. Not loud, but very, very strong. Um, Beethoven, in his later years, comes more and more back to the fugue and to counterpoint. as this kind of, almost a symbol of the assertion of the will, um, as it were. Anyway, the fugue marches along beautifully, and then it's suddenly interrupted. By, and we cascade back down into the world of the, the Arioso Dolente, the sad song. But now Beethoven writes, ermatet, klaget, which means exhausted, wailing. In other words, it's, it's like the great singer of the first song who now has lost her voice and can't, is gasping for breath. And it finally dies away, gasping for breath, and all that's left is in heartbeat. You hear this is a chord, it's repeated. It's just, and then out of this heartbeat comes the fugue again. Now piano is soft as possible at first, um, upside down in, from the first inversion. Um, Beethoven writes, you know, the fugue in reverse, and he writes something very interesting in German. He writes, Nach und nach wieder auflebend, little by little coming back to life. So it's a story really of resurrection, of almost coming to the pit, both maybe psychologically, spiritually, physically, always. And gradually the view comes back and then finally comes back um, right side up, as it were, and ends in a blaze of glory. There's something about playing in this time we're living in right now, a piece of the story about which is, is, is death or near death suffering and, and resurrection, I think that makes it especially appropriate. So this is the Beethoven Sonata in A-flat major, opus 110.
Now we're going to move to something completely different, although not so many years later, two works by, two groups of two works by Frederick Chopin. The first will be two nocturnes, which I'm continuing on the theme of intimacy, where in, in some ways Chopin's very intimate works, the works conjuring up, evoking the night, and sort of romance, let's say. Um, but more than anything else, what Chopin is interested in in his nocturnes is evoking the human voice. Chopin after Mozart, is the first piano composer who really is concerned in trying to write for the piano in a way that evokes the voice, that not so much imitates it, but gives the same kinds of expression and feelings, immediacy, directness that the human voice does. And in these two contrasting nocturnes, which um, were published together, um, very much as sort of foils for each other, Chopin explores two different ways um, to use the voice. The first in C-sharp minor is a very dramatic and, and uh, um, quite starkly dramatic work in its own way with the great contrast in the middle section, um, very much in ABA. And um, this, by the way, was one of Wagner's favorite pieces of Chopin. He evidently always asked uh, for it to be played for him. Um, the second, the D-flat major, a uh, very famous one, is much more operatic, much more Italian, um, but also very beautifully intimate and shows um, Chopin's extraordinary ability to create beautiful melodic lines on the piano, which after all is in itself only a percussion instrument. So these are two Chopin etudes, opus 27 number one and opus 27 number two in C sharp minor and in D flat major.
Now I'll play two other works of Chopin, um, two waltzes. Now we think of the waltz today in a very different way than they did in the 1830s and 40s. Today, for us, the waltz is rather a stiff, formal, old-fashioned kind of, you know, dance, conjures up to sort of a very formal setting, really. But for Chopin's day, the waltz was a very intimate, a theme of intimacy. Actually, it may have been the first dance in all of European history where one couple held each other in their arms. It was a chance for people uh, to do something very audacious, which in normal life they could never do. Um, and Chopin wrote his waltzes to conjure up the various mood of, uh, that dancing would bring. It's not, they weren't actually written to be waltzed to, as Johann Strauss's were 50, 60 years later. Um, so the first of these waltzes, the famous waltz of C-sharp minor, um, very languorous, sensual, sort of you see them whirling around. It creates this very sort of romantic and, and sensual atmosphere. Um, the second waltz, very brilliant, um, conjures up, I think, more like the champagne and beautiful chandeliers and, 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 and uh, um, just the, 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 the extraordinary gaiety and, and brilliance of the, of, the, of the whole thing. But still, I think in its own way, the waltz remains an intimate form. So these are two Chopin waltzes, C-sharp minor and A-flat major, opus 42.
To end the program, we're going to go to Wagner. And for Wagner, I chose um, pr probably the most extraordinary intimate passage, maybe in its own way in the history of music. Um, it's this sequence in the second act from Tristan und Isolde of the love duet starting pretty much just before O Sieger Nieder Nacht der Liebe, when the two singers actually sing together. And then um, the passage where the, the lovers are quiet and we hear um, the voice, the unseen voice of Brangena, Brangena's famous Habit Acht, uh, her watch, warning them that um, the night will end. Um, the intimacy of this scene is, is an interesting contrast to that of the Schumann, let's say, from the beginning of the program. Because, of course, the Schumann is just the intimacy of the individual. Whereas this, it's as if these two souls are the only people in the universe. It's this kind of sense of both being very, very intimate, and yet at the same time, the whole world, the whole universe. Indeed, um, at the climax, right before um, Brangena comes in, they, um, the, the two, Tristan and Isolde, sing, Selbst dann bin ich die Welt. Then, only then, am I the world. Um, this idea of this unity of the world, which is um, a, a very important, a very, actually, theologically philosophically religious idea interest on the un union of the unit with the universe is really at the heart of the very very special intimate quality of this music um, you one might wonder why I would specifically choose to play on the piano a very homemade transcription of a passage of passages which are so vocal both certainly the Ozinka Niedernacht Liebe, the duet, and then Brangena's watch with her voice. And I think part of the reason is that I find them very appealing is because I can't think of any time um, where the voice is more completely intermeshed, interwoven, almost like a part of the orchestra, especially in the Brangena episode, where really it's almost impossible to say what is the voice and what is the orchestra all sort of winding together. So with this um, really extraordinary passage, uniquely beautiful passage from Wagner, um, I'll end the program. I want to thank again the Wagner Society and wish everybody a very happy New Year.
The Wagner Society of New York is very grateful to Jeffrey Swan for his quite remarkable gift to us. We would also like to acknowledge uh, Matt Berman, whose dedication to the work of the Society as a cinematographer has allowed this and other contributions to our community. Thank you very much, Matt. We're happy to announce that the next offering of the Wagner Society of New York will take place on Sunday. February 28 at three in the afternoon, where uh, Professor Emeritus uh, 
Harlow Robinson from Northeastern University will be our guest. He will be uh, addressing a work that I don't know, and I suspect that I'm not alone in not knowing, Rimsky-Korsakov's Invisible City of Kitesh. And the, the title of his presentation is The Russian Parsifal. And I hope that you will all join us for that. Thank you all for being with us this afternoon. I remind you that the Wagner Society of New York is quite a remarkable generator, not only of these wonderful events, but also of fellowship, uh, scholarship, and friendship. And those of you who are not members of the Wagner Society of New York, I hope will consider joining the society, especially these days with Zoom. The reach of wonderful organizations like that is they're no longer regional and they're open for us all. Again, thank you all for coming and I do hope to see you all on Sunday, February 28th.